So um, I also want to thank the organizer, like everybody else, and also all of you for still being here at, uh, uh, very late. Um, and also, it's uh, great to talk now, actually, because uh, there has been already uh, many talks on quantum sensing, so I can uh, really focus on uh, um, some of the messages uh, that I really care about, which is that we can already get some practical quantum advantage uh, in sensing with uh, today's uh, device. So, go ahead. Um, back in uh, 2017, with my colleague, uh, Christian Friedman, uh, we sort of went ahead and tried to define a little bit uh, the status uh, uh, of the art in, in quantum sensing, uh, defining a, a few different levels of sensor that uh, we might have. And of course, for uh, quite some time, uh, people have used um, sensors which are quantum in nature, uh, but exploiting them typically just uh, based on classical um, description. And so we are not so much interested in uh, this type of sensor. We're more interested um, in the other two categories uh, one, where we're just exploiting some quantum properties, like the coherence of a quantum system, uh, to detect things. And then uh, another one, where we're really exploiting uh, the more fundamental quantum properties, such as entanglement, in order to achieve a quantum advantage. And really, um, I think that this is uh, um, the first uh, um, practical use of uh, uh, quantum uh, entanglement uh, um, in, uh, in an experiment. Uh, uh, to detect black holes uh, uh, done in, in LAGO, uh, led by uh, Lisa Barsotti and Nergis Mavalvala, um, as long as you consider detecting gravitational wave as a practical thing, uh, maybe not uh, commercial, but still. Um, however, of course, it's very difficult, uh, uh, besides uh, uh, using a very uh, special system, to achieve uh, entanglement in a robust way. Uh, so what we can do is also to open a little gap between uh, these two types of sensor and try to use some small uh, quantum entangled states, some uh, small uh, uh, quantum logic uh, between a, a small quantum system in order to achieve tasks which are not possible without quantum mechanics. So really uh, try to do something practical, and that uh, might be a bit more short term than um, trying to go for a large uh, entanglement. Uh, but before I go into that, so why quantum sensing? We have already heard uh, from a few speakers uh, that uh, uh, quantum systems are very good at sensing uh, external perturbation. And indeed, this is why we don't have a Schrodinger cat, typically, because it's destroyed by any minuscule perturbation. And so what makes for very difficult task in achieving quantum computer makes quantum sensor a bit easier. Uh, but I want to uh, also remind you that we really want to leave uh, at the border between um, destroying your quantum system because uh, they're interacting with external perturbation and actually keeping their quantum coherence, which is what is going to give you uh, this advantage in sensing, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of similar uh, to the advantage that you can have uh, in computing. So with the scaling uh, size of your sensor, you can have a better scaling of your sensitivity than uh, for a classical sensor. Uh, luckily, we don't need uh, exponential um, behavior in order to get some advantage for sensing, as uh, uh, we have uh, discussed about uh, uh, what you need uh, for, for quantum computation. And indeed, there has been uh, already some uh, use uh, for uh, these, uh, these ideas, uh, especially uh, one technology which is uh, uh, very much ahead, um, I think, uh, uh, in achieving uh, um, like extremely uh, uh, good uh, sensitivities are atomic clock, and we already uh, heard uh, from June, and uh, uh, this is also work uh, together with Anna Maria Rey, who unfortunately is not here. And uh, these are uh, really uh, the type of systems that uh, are reaching uh, levels of sensitivity which are uh, impossible uh, without uh, um, uh, also exploiting some uh, level of quantum mechanics in order to push uh, further and further uh, the performance. And indeed, uh, one of the things that uh, you might uh, want to do in order to achieve this <coughs> quantum advantage is to uh, replace uh, a simple operation which creates a superposition with more complex operation which actually create uh, uh, entanglement, so large-scale entanglement like uh, a GZS state. And this was uh, a scheme uh, proposed by uh, Susanna Huelga and, uh, uh, and various collaborators. And more recently, uh, this has been uh, sort of uh, replaced uh, with a more robust type of entanglement, uh, um, uh, spin squeezing, uh, and uh, this idea of sort of bringing back the squeeze in order to have a more practical measurement was proposed uh, by uh, Monica Shai smith uh, back in 16, and this has been indeed uh, put uh, into practice uh, uh, by actually her uh, former advisor, uh, Vlada Buletic, and Monica is also uh, working on it right now. And this is really uh, what is uh, uh, sort of transforming uh, what is, uh, if you want, a 
uh, almost classical distributed of a quantum object in terms of uh, um, the uncertainty into a truly uh, quantum one where you're sort of squeezing in one direction the uncertainty at the expenses of uh, the uncertainty in the other direction. And this can give, in this experiment, about a 15 times uh, faster um, averaging uh, of the signal with respect to not uh, using uh, entanglement. So you start to see um, some uh, type of uh, real advantage. And the idea here, again, is to use entanglement, which, of course, comes from interaction. And this uh, uh, is going to be uh, like an important point uh, um, in a little bit. Of course, um, uh, Atomic clocks um, uh, are uh, tremendous, uh, um, as I say, sensors. But we would like to sense something else besides time, or at least I'm very much interested in that. And so what I like uh, uh, is another type of sensor uh, based on the uh, Natogen Vacancy Center in Diamond that we already heard uh, about this system, uh, for example, from uh, Martin Plenion uh, earlier uh, in, uh, uh, in the week. And these are uh, truly amazing uh, defects in diamond, which give rise to a nice pink color uh, in the diamond. And they can be used uh, for many different applications uh, because they are truly nanoscale. And so they allow uh, to do something which is not possible uh, with classical sensor. Uh, they're extremely sensitive because they combine magnetic resonance, like MRI, not sensitive. But now you have optical access to your sensors. And so this uh, is uh, truly game changing. And also they are biocompatible. It's just carbon. You can put it inside the cell, and the cell is totally happy uh, to live about that. So there's been some uh, truly remarkable uh, achievement uh, doing uh, biosensing um, combined with bioimaging, so using quantum mechanics to enhance uh, the bioimaging, um, um, measuring, for example, magnetism at the nanoscale using a, a scanning tip, which has a diamond on the AFM tip itself to uh, go around and look at things really at the nanoscale doing NMR, again, at the nanoscale, uh, single molecule, single uh, nuclear spin detection using uh, one uh, MD sensor. So all of this is enabled, again, uh, by using, if you want, quantum mechanics, but really in the simplest form. It's just like one single electronic spin that you could think of, you can maybe describe it almost as a classical diamond. So what is this uh, MD sensor? As I said, it's a defect in diamond which is optically active, meaning that you can uh, see it uh, by illuminating your sample with some uh, green light, like I do this. And if you put on uh, your laser goggles, you now see just uh, the fluorescence emission, which is uh, in the red. So this is the light coming uh, from the diamond itself. This is like in my um, uh, setup. This is a, a, an ensemble of NV center, so it's uh, uh, that red. And the, of course, the nice thing is that you can um, both um, illuminate it Polarize means uh, prepare it uh, in a high purity state, a low, effective low temperature state. And you can also control it uh, by doing uh, just normal uh, NMR or ESR techniques, uh, so doing uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, and these are, um, if you want, pioneering uh, results back in 2006 by uh, Lily Childress, uh, doing uh, sort of a, a rabbit type of experiment where, again, you can detect optically the state of the spin because the state one is less bright uh, than the state zero, thanks to um, the um, different uh, optical uh, um, uh, cycles uh, of uh, the defect itself. So this works uh, both as, as I say, the uh, fluorescence biomarker, but it has, in addition, uh, this uh, a property to be a spin, which acts a little bit like a, a compass here. And so you can detect magnetic field by looking at how the spin uh, state uh, changes with time. So I mentioned before uh, that if you want to have these two uh, quantum advantages, with scaling uh, with n, the number of sensors of your sensitivity, you need some type of interaction to create entanglement. Uh, you do have interaction, of course, when you use uh, a solid state system like uh, these uh, spin defects in diamond. Uh, but in some sense, you have too many interactions. They are disordered, they are as strong, it's difficult to control them. So despite uh, back in uh, 2009, I'm a bit ashamed, we proposed to use the spin interaction to create a squeeze state with NV centers. And beautifully, we would have reached a much better scaling of the sensitivity, so the mean field that you can detect uh, with the number of spin, uh, with respect to uh, if you don't use an entangled state, uh, <laughs> while we still have not done it um, in, in practice. Uh, and not even uh, Michel Lukin, who can do any experiment or can have people do any experiment with him, um, has not done it. Uh, what we have been able to do is to at least show uh, that we can control uh, the coupling well enough 
so that uh, your sensitivity improves if you um, erase all the cups. Um, doing instead, an, uh, uh, if you want, an engineering of the coupling so that the create entanglement uh, uh, is still uh, uh, to be done. And uh, actually, I'm hopeful because we are developing better and better control techniques, and also the materials are, are improving. So hopefully, we will be able to go here and realize uh, this uh, by now quite old dream. Uh, but as I said, uh, in general, it's difficult with solid uh, system uh, to actually achieve this uh, truly uh, quantum advantage. And so, as I said, we will try to do something which is the quantum sensing not so much beyond the standard quantum limit, so what you can achieve with classical means, uh, but if you want something like uh, uh, quantum sensing beside the standard quantum limit, so still get some quantum advantage without really looking for, for this scaling. And we can do that by just using some small quantum system and trying to do things that you cannot do otherwise. For example, improve the coherence time by adding control, by adding quantum error correction, uh, looking at correlation by adding a quantum memory, uh, do frequency conversion, looking at uh, uh, multi-parameter sensing like vectorial sensing, uh, by again including not just one single uh, spin, but a few of them. So I'm gonna uh, do in the rest of my time, uh, I'm gonna uh, show you a few examples of this. So the first example was to really exploit the nuclear spin, which is associated with the MB center, to do something that otherwise is not possible. So I already showed you uh, this uh, graph, uh, but I didn't tell you that the uh, nitrogen vacuum center, of course, also has a nuclear spin, which is associated with the uh, nitrogen 14, which is a spin one of the NB itself. And we can do a similar oscillation and map them out by reading the nuclear spin via the electronic spin. And so we have some additional uh, energy level that we can control. So how can we exploit that? So one of the uh, techniques to improve the sensitivity of um, classical apparatus is to use uh, uh, locking detection, uh, where you can reject noise by uh, sort of up converting uh, a signal that you want to measure, which might be a DC signal, with uh, a local oscillator, which is at a higher frequency. That allows you to uh, use a band pass filter to uh, only detect things which are up converted while all the noise can be cancelled out. Um, we can do this with uh, MV sensor and other uh, quantum uh, sensor, uh, but of course we would be losing this char character which is like the nanoscale uh, properties of MV, which is uh, what makes them uh, really interesting. So how can we do that uh, using a quantum system? Well, we can remember that we have an intrinsic local oscillator which is associated with the nuclear spin. The uh, N14 has its own frequency of 5 megahertz. It's fixed as the quadrupolar uh, interaction. And it can be mixed with uh, the signal coming externally from some other magnetic field in order to drive now uh, an upconverted uh, field at the location of the electronic spin. And their distance is just uh, less than one nanometer. It's just really angstrom uh, level. So you do not lose the spatial resolution that you have for MB sensor. So uh, by uh, exploiting nonlinearity between the coupling between the electronic spin and the nuclear spin, you do this up conversion, and then you can use these uh, uh, sequences, I think that Martin already uh, explained to you, where you can uh, sort of synchronize your signal with high pulses to rectify the signal and cancel out all the rest of the noise. And so we're really reproducing this uh, locking amplifier now down to the quantum level uh, using uh, just two qubits, uh, which are correlated, uh, but uh, you're not using like a large scale uh, in time. And we did that, we can now measure uh, the transverse field, so the uh, upconverted field is uh, the transverse field. We can detect uh, the longitudinal field using normal Ramsey method, and so we ha have not only a protected uh, um, detection of the transverse field, uh, but also a fully uh, vector magnetometer by just using uh, a single uh, qubit pair. And we find that more or less we have uh, the same sensitivity for the two methods, and so we can truly detect the vectorial information of a static field. And this was work by um, a student here, Ishan Liu, who's now a postdoc. Uh, still exploiting a nuclear spin, we can also try to implement quantum error correction. And the idea for quantum error correction uh, for sensing is uh, pretty simple. So instead of having just a long evolution during which you might have noise, which destroy your signal, uh, you interrupt it. And in between, you put some recovery operation uh, where you measure uh, an ancillary uh, qubit and operate uh, on your sensor if you detect an error. And uh, as you can see here, you have some small entanglement between uh, your quantum sensor and one or more ancilla in order to enable. So again, 
a small quantity of entanglement is not with the Eisenberg scaling, but still gives you something which is not otherwise possible. Um, these schemes uh, was a sort of requiring uh, for your ancillary qubit to be completely noiseless. Uh, so we tried to find something which was uh, a bit more practical because it's difficult to find completely noiseless uh, qubits. Uh, um, and so uh, in the work uh, of my former student, David Leiden, and uh, Cici Zhu, who's now a professor at Perimeter Institute, uh, we found some condition which allowed us to indeed find some good uh, quantum error correcting code for sensing, which are a bit difficult than uh, the one uh, for a quantum computer, uh, which were able to maximize the quantum fissure information. I think it's been discussed um, in, in this workshop, but it's a, a metric for sensitivity. If you want. And so this was uh, work back uh, in 2008. So another thing that you can do is now to try to use uh, one of your qubits in order to control uh, the quantum sensor that we have. And in uh, uh, our system, indeed, we did that by using the electronic spin to uh, control the nuclear spin. So why do we, need, uh, why do we want to use a nuclear spin uh, for sensing? They are quite insensitive, so they're actually very good memory, but typically it's not uh, your sensor of choice because they do not interact strongly with external perturbation. However, the one thing that uh, they can actually detect very well are physical rotation, because all spins will also be uh, uh, sensitive to just physical rotation, and, there is, uh, uh, they're, uh, and they're all equally sensitive uh, to it. So uh, you then would exploit the fact that you have much longer coherence time and the same uh, overall uh, dependence on the rotation. And in our system, of course, we will need the electronic spin in order to mediate uh, the initialization of your nuclear spin and also its readout. And we also added uh, the control. And this uh, would make for creating um, a gyroscope uh, out uh, of diamond here. And there are, of course, our group, uh, uh, including Alexei, uh, working on. So when we were trying to study the coherence of the nuclear spin, we found some uh, puzzling uh, behavior, at least at the time we were uh, puzzling. Uh, where the <coughs> coherence time of the nuclear spin, if the electronic spin is in its uh, ms equal zero state, was much longer than when uh, the uh, electronic spin was in the ms uh, equal one uh, in plus or minus one state by quite, uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, we uh, later realized that since we were using um, ensembles uh, of uh, nuclear spin, we were seeing the effect of inhomogeneities in both the hyperfine coupling between the electronic and nuclear spin and also the quadrupola. So we found actually a way um, in this paper to uh, sort of correct for that, but then we were asking ourselves, well, can we find another system where this problem might not arise? So for example, we don't have any quadrupolar interaction, which are a bit unknown. Well, we can use a different type of nuclear spin, a different isotope, uh, natogen 15, which is a spin one alpha. So immediately don't have the quadrupolar interaction, so uh, no more um, um, like decay due to that. And if the MV is in MS equal zero, you should also not have um, any hyperfine because uh, uh, the magnetic moment is, is just zero. However, we saw that we had a slightly better result for MS equal zero than for minus one, but the coherence time was not even as long as what we were uh, getting here. So something else was going on. And indeed, this statement that there is no hyperfine is actually wrong, if you think about it, because you have transverse hyperfine zone. So they are uh, suppressed because the NV uh, electronic spin energy is very, very large, and so they're typically, you can sort of forget about it, uh, but in this case, we could not forget about it. Indeed, you have an effective resonance shift due to a transverse field, uh, even when uh, the NV is in the zero state. So this is uh, uh, the coefficient which uh, tells us how much uh, your uh, frequency is shifted. And this can be quite large, actually, uh, sort of explodes when you're close to the uh, avoid the crossing of the uh, electronic spin. I don't have the time to go into that. But it's pretty large also for small magnetic scale for this uh, alpha zero. And so we need to take into account. So uh, what my uh, student, uh, Mintit, came up with is a way to control, to refocus this effect by actually acting, if you want, on your spin bus, the electronic spin, in order to protect your qubit. So it's pretty simple. You just have to do basically an echo sequence which will allow you to indeed uh, refocus the effect of inhomogeneities in the upper fine. And this works uh, quite beautifully, so this is uh, the result from before, and we can extend now uh, much more uh, the coherence time uh, to uh, about uh, uh, 3.5 uh, milliseconds. Now it's limited more by the uh, NVT1, um, so we still have to uh, solve that problem. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, in any case, gives a much more robust 
sensor to indeed uh, detect uh, rotation. So I uh, leave here with my uh, take home message. So this uh, on the slide is my uh, fourth take home message. And I think uh, hopefully you figure out what was my second not so hidden uh, take home message. Thank you.